Hi, and welcome back. Uh, it, would, it is very difficult to talk about which of these presentations uh, is the most exciting uh, because we have, uh, in the words of Bilbo, uh, such admirable, excellent and admirable hobbits here. Um, and uh, or I suppose dwarves is more appropriate. It's the best I could come up with. Um, but if I had to choose one presentation uh, that I would pay to see uh, of all this lineup, the one that you're about to see is it. Uh, Peter Johnson is, in my opinion, he will probably argue with me about this, but it's my opinion, I'm entitled to it, is the leading expert uh, that can actually make the blade on the medieval sword living today. Um, he has examined hundreds of artifacts uh, in person, in museums. He is uh, well-respected both in the bladesmithing community and also uh, among Western martial artists. Who, If you've never seen the movie Reclaiming the Blade, you should watch it so you know what that means. Um, he has uh, had a uh, absolutely astounding effect on my work, and I know he's influenced many others in that way, many of them who are in this room. Uh, so it's with great pleasure that I turn this over to Peter Johnson, and uh, hold on to your horses. You're going to find out what a sword really is, and I bet you don't know, but you're about to. Take it away, Peter. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Dave, and, and everyone else who make this possible. It's, it's just incredible to be here in Alaska, meeting my best friends and colleagues, and spending a week working with swords and learning from these guys, and it's just incredible. And now I get an all, a whole of an hour to, to bore you to death with swords. And it's all about these things. This happens to be a, a, a reconstruction of a sword that was found in the, in the riverbed of the River Furis in my hometown of Uppsala. Uh, the, the find was made in the mid-19th century. Uh, the original was made, I don't know, sometimes in the late 1100s or the 1200s. We won't ever know for certain, I think. But it was um, a very interesting journey to, to study this sword and make a reconstruction of that. This I will talk about more tomorrow when I come um, to focus on the, the aesthetics of the sword and perhaps a little bit on the symbolical meaning of the sword. Because I do believe the sword is much, much more than just a, a sum of its um, making and its functional properties. There are much, much more things involved in it. And if we just look around us in popular culture today, we will be just, this is very much proven. It's, it's an object of fascination. You can't, you can't go through a normal day without seeing swords wielded by heroes slaying monsters or demons or, 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 or foes of some kind. It's a very, very vivid part of our imagination today. And it's not just any weapon. It's not just a, a killing tool. Anyone who tries to reduce it to an efficient killing tool, I think, is missing a large part of what the sword is. Um, the sword is and has ever been also an attribute. It's been a carrier of, of, of symbol. It has been um, an expression of, of deep values in every society where it has been made. And it's a very deeply conflicted object. It's an object of art. It's an object of science and engineering, of very highly qualified craft. But it's also an expression of a language, a, a carrier of myths. Uh, so no wonder we are fascinated by it today when we are so disconnected from these things and are alienated from history and tradition and have to make it up through fantasy. And there's nothing wrong in that. We've always been doing it. But I do believe that our dreams and our fantasies, our stories and our reality will be much richer if we learn from what was actually happening and what was actually true some centuries or millennia ago. And, and then the sword will become a mirror to us. We can see ourselves in the swords and the image we see may surprise us. So for me, the study of the sword is um, a lifelong passion. And I can't really explain why I became a swordsmith. It's, uh, it's something that I found myself in the middle of, sometime in the middle of my life. And I've sort of bowed to the fact that Okay, I am a swordsmith, so I better try to do the best I can out of that. And by doing that choice, all kinds of doors opened, and I met fantastic colleagues and, and made friendships with incredible artists and artisans around the world that I 
previously only had heard about and read about and seen their work. So I feel enormously privileged to be able to dedicate my life to this, this um, ancient craft. And I believe that there are perhaps no real masters of this craft today. I mean, they are all dead, long gone. But they left a heritage to us, and we can learn from that by studying surviving artifacts and reading the sagas. And, and just like we've seen earlier today, there are these tidbits of techniques and materials. We can learn from archaeology and metallurgy. We can learn from myth. And that will flesh out the picture. But there's nothing replacing putting yourself in the smithy and pacing yourself through the act of actually making one of these swords. And the, the approach that I have chosen in exploring this craft is by looking carefully at originals and making measurements and tracings and trying to understand what makes them into what they are. Metallurgy is, of course, important and, and uh, function, but there is a design aspect that involves other things as well. And I will try to cover this today. I will try to give an, uh, an outline of what are sort of some of the basic aspects of the, of the design of the sword. Um, I will show you how I make a sword in the smithy. I will show you some examples of my recent work. And I will end this talk with a... Um, a presentation of some functional aspects that makes the sword ring and sing and, and, and function as it's intended to. Um, and I think, I think the best way is to, to walk you through the making of a sword. And what I'm going to show you is uh, th these are photographs taken by Lutz Hofmeister, who works at the Deutsches Klingen Museum in, in Solingen. And these photographs were taken um, in connection with an exhibition we made early in the 2000s, um, where the assignment was to make a replication, a replica or reconstruction of one of their swords and to try to incorporate techniques that would have been used in the making of this sword. Um, so what you're going to see in these images, it will look like my younger brother, but it's actually me, only like <laughs> 10 or something years ago. So well, that's not me. The craft of the sword, and this is about reconstructing a 13th century sword. And again, the photos are by Lutz Hofmeister. He's a very good photographer. As you've been told by some previous presentator here and seen examples of the, the making of a sword is of forging, but very, very much about polishing and filing. So I don't know who told me this, but uh, the, this, so one of the greatest assets or qualities of a bladesmith is um, tolerance for tedium. You need to be able to find it enjoyable to, to create a lot of dust. So that's sort of an essence of the craft. The, the, cr the starting point of making a sword uh, is to look at originals. And they can survive in various states of preservation. Um, as you see in the image, they can be just like broken shards of pottery or like a uh, crumbling ginger cookie. So very, very much remains to be sort of imagined to make it into a proper... Uh, object again. And in those cases, it's very important to look at other pieces that are more well preserved and, and, and give you better information. And in some cases, they are almost as new, perhaps a little bit of, of, of dullness in the surface and some pits from corrosion, but basically, they could be just a little bit worn and, and, and the, the owner just recently left the room. Uh, these are pieces of great presence and you can learn a lot from them. Um, the topic of this reconstruction was an original that was found um, in Germany, I do believe. Um, it has a few cousins in other collections. There's one famous, rather similar sword in the Royal Armies in Leeds. Um, there are a few others with similar hilt components and similar blades. So it's a kind of a little family of swords. Um, dating is not really secure, not that I know of, but we can think about it as... as uh, 
13th century and feel pretty secure about that. Uh, you may notice that the pommel is of a peculiar form. It is almost like a wheel pommel, but uh, its central hub is um, almond-shaped, or shall we say mandorla, or vesica-shaped, which is uh, the intersection of two circles. Uh, and that makes a, it's a very interesting form to, to forge and to grind. Um, it's eminently functional and it's a very effective form as in this rather enclosed form you, you can have a lot of volume. So uh, the first step is to roll out a long piece of paper and trace the sword with a, uh, with a pencil and try to get the line as close to the outline as possible and this will take a few tries and uh, judgments to, to correlate the lines you've drawn. You take measurements and write them down around this line. And this is a critical step. You need to get this right. And you try to absorb as much information as possible during this situation. If there are nicks or damages in the blade, if some piece is missing, you can use this opportunity to sort of hint where you believe that the outline would have been. Because you, you get an impression from the original that may be lost when you come home, or rather, it's most probably lost. So you have to rely on your rather fleeting memory uh, and try to hook up these impressions on, try to, to, to say, tell you for, to yourself what you're seeing, because you're going to remember that better than just watching. Make drawings, take photographs. So trace it, measure it, photograph it, to get as rich a material as possible to relate to. And the result is this tracing, which will include views of the pommel from different directions, the guard from different directions, cross-section of the blade, depth of fuller, radius of fuller, and not the least, things like edge geometry. How does the blade go from the thickest part to its thinnest part, where it ceases to exist? The, the shape of that curve, the, the angle of the edge, if it's still there, this is crucial information if you want to make this sword. If the state of the original so allows, you need to document some of the dynamic aspects of the sword. And I'm going to return to this later on when talking about the function of the sword. So this is things like point of balance, which is not as important as you may believe when you read about swords. Everyone talks about the placing of the point of balance. And there is this belief that the closer you get to the guard, the better the balance. And this is quite just nonsense because it's not true. It's rather try to put the point of balance as far as way it can from the hilt and still make the sword manageable. That is the art. It's a, again one of these paradoxes you'll find in, in sword design that you'll also always or at least very often have to try to balance opposites. A sword needs to to hit with force and, and, and weight, but it needs to feel light in the hand. Um, it needs to track true uh, through the cut, but it must be nimble and react very quickly to, to maneuvers of your hand and body and arm. It's, it should be agile, but still uh, sure in, in its aim. It has to be um, hard, but also tough. It needs to be stiff, but also flexible. Um, so it has to fulfill all these things that are really opposite uh, qualities. So the making of a sword is really a balancing of these things, or finding a happy compromise, if, if you like. When you have the tracing, um, and you come home, you can make a clean drawing if you want to, or some kind of um, blueprint uh, to nail up on the wall in the smithy, because I do believe it's very, very good to have a full-length, full-size image of the sword to relate to always throughout work. Um, <coughs> and the actual making of the blade in this case started off with making um, three pieces, uh, two of steel and one of iron, because we believe that this was a sword that was forged with a soft iron core and steel outer casing. And this is uh, something that you may be familiar of from before. You always hear about this soft back and hard edge and how it's supposed to make the sword more flexible and, and strong. I don't believe that's quite the case why they did this, because if you have a sword of 
the kind of material they had at this time period, which is a rather heterogenic steel uh, of varying carbon content. And most of all, it's going to be pretty shallow hardening, low hardenability, meaning that when you quench this sword, if it's just a, a completely made out of steel, the part that's really going to be hard it's, it's this section. This is if you, if you do heat treat it, and some swords did have very, very sketchy heat treats. Not, not all were really that hard. We must understand that. But in those cases where you do heat treat and quench the sword, it's not going to get very hard in the main body anyway. You're going to have a mixture of different kind of, of um, microstructures that are not hardened steel, but are sort of a much tougher version of it. And knowing this, we might as well replace this valuable steel with iron here, because iron and steel in this place will do the same thing. So it's like uh, iron will be more cheaply available than good steel. So if you can replace a third or say two-fifths of the sword with just normal iron instead of using steel, in the long run you'll be much better off. So I think it's, it's a practical economical thing as much as anything else. Uh, because these guys who made swords, they didn't just make one and feel good about it. And, and, and uh, they, they made many, many swords. We know that they had uh, contracts with different subcontractors and they were part of a, of a group of craftsmen working together. The bladesmith did normally not do the complete sword. He just made the blade for it. Perhaps he didn't even heat treat it or possibly, quite possibly, didn't even grind it because these things were done by specialists. You had one guy who was really good at heat treating and you had one guy who was good at grinding. Uh, there was possibly another smith who made a hilt for the sword and everything was put together by yet another craftsman who could be like the entrepreneur in the, in the group who uh, subcontracted contracted the, the other craftsmen. So um, they were working with very efficient work methods. The sword was never a singular product. It was made as a group of, ob one in a group of objects. Um, so this image we have of, of the lone swordsmith working with this precious thing in his, in his cottage in the Germanic forest, you know, uh, half naked and quenching it in the snow. And it's, it's just so far from the very exciting reality that you can get. These guys were working in intricate um, interconnections with, with business contracts and, and fierce competition and, and politics in, in these uh, towns. And I think that situation is so much more intriguing because you will find them having to deal with, with many, many aspects of, of medieval life and politics and beliefs and uh, the, the waging of wars. And, and they were smack in the middle of this. The sword was necessary both for the destruction of your enemy and for the upkeep of your own society. And, and uh, there was even a class in society who were honor-bound to use these objects, the knights, the, the fighting class. So it's a very, very different world from, from our world, in some ways, at least. So, um, back to the smithy. I have these three bars of material. The, the more narrow one in the middle, as you see, that is the soft iron core. It's more, made more narrow, so the edges or of, of these steel bars will be able to pinch around and meet them, so I don't get iron in the edge. Uh, and it's uh, done so that the, um, the steel bars uh, are wrapped around the, the central core and, and just the two bars are welded together in the, in the point of this billet. So you, you get something like, uh, something like this. Here's only steel and then a little bit back from this you have an, an iron core like, like this. And your goal is to create something that will, in the end, look like this. So you, you weld sections together and work your way up the blade. I don't know if you can see this clearly in the image. I hope you can. Um, I do, do the first welds uh, by hand, but I also rely on a trip hammer, which is uh, foot-powered, and a power hammer. Um, and the, the First thing you, you hear when you say that I have a power hammer in my smithy, you, you get this chorus of 
Oh, you're cheating. They did they didn't have power hammers back in the medieval times and well, sorry to say, but that is just how things are. I don't have a water-powered hammer. I can't employ three sledge helpers. I don't have an earth floor. I don't have um, you know, torches in the floor, and I, I don't have you know TBC from. It's we live in a different world, and and the th the thing is that if the the myth of the sword, it's so strong. It blinds us. The idea of what the swordsmith is, it's so incredibly strong. You see it in sort of every game, in every, every fantasy novel, there's some gruff and her <laughs> type that is the swordsmith. And he's, he's such a strong individual that you, you, it's, it's just impossible for a real craftsman actually doing this for real, who knows these, the true mysteries of the sword, to say, well, I'm actually doing this, you know. But you fade in comparison to this bigger than life image of what the swordsmith should be. And the same thing is true for the sword. The real sword is very different from what you, what you get to understand in, 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 in popular presentations of it. Once you've put this billet together, uh, the first thing I do is to form the tang. Uh, the tang is the part of the sword that will go through the hilt. It's, it's a square spike of material. It doesn't have to be heat treated. On many medieval swords, this was a, a welded on part uh, of, of softer material, tougher and softer material. Again, also to save from using expensive steel in a part that won't be hardened anyway. But uh, even if it's not visible in the final sword, the shape of the tang is also important in the, in the, in the all of thing. It's, it has to have... Um, a certain shape to be able to carry the guard and the pommel later on and um, its mass will have an effect also in the overall balance of the sword. Marginal but still there. Um, so what you then get is a rectangular bar uh, with a sort of a narrower end in, in one section and you then turn the things around and start to forge the actual blade blank. And this is drawn out, and I do it since I cheat in, in an air hammer. Um, and what you do now is very, very important for the final sword because the, the width and thickness of this bar and how it decreases in width and thickness will decide the final balance of the sword because now is the place, the time when you establish the mass distribution of the blade. If you can, if you can imagine the base being... Uh, quite a bit thicker and it grows thinner to uh, a smaller end. And, and the degree by it, how it grows thinner and um, less wide um, will remain even afterwards when you start to forge in the cross section and you draw out the edges. You will still have the same proportion, the same mass distribution. So you can't change that later unless you want to destroy that carefully shaped cross section. So that's why the, this, the shaping of, the, the, of the, this initial billet is, um, is crucial for the final blade. Uh, and, and this is also a time when you start to get feedback directly from, from this billet of steel. Because once you start to put in this taper, it, it begins to take on a little, a little part of its final character. You will start to feel it begin to move like a sword rather than just a bar of steel. I hate this saying that the sword is nothing but a sharpened bar of steel. You know, nothing could be far further from the truth. It's like saying that a knight is nothing but, but a tin can filled with human flesh. You know, every essential aspect of what the sword is or the knight is is sort of left out of the picture. The sword is anything but a sharpened steel bar. You, it's, it's all about reducing uh, dead meat. It's all about planning ahead and, and fulfilling your intentions and, and staying sharp throughout the process. In this case, I had to forge in the fuller. I'm not one who's going to say that a forged blade is inherently superior to a ground blade. Uh, because if you, if you forge a blade, you're going to put it through a lot of heating and cooling cycles. And this will create a, a chaos of different structures in the blade. To 
balance this out in the end, you need to normalize it. We'll get to that later. But that means when you normalize it, you take away all those things you've done with the hammer. And that's your intention. You should do that. So after forging, you need to sort of kill the material. You need to you deaden it. It shouldn't have any memory of the forging. If it does, it'll play a trick on you. So once after normalization, ideally what you should end up with is something very, very much like a, a bar of steel that you get from the steel merchant. Just a nor normalized, very unexciting, but properly shaped bar of steel. In this case, I did have to forge the fuller because of the soft core. If I was going to grind the fuller in, I would, going to, I will, I would expose this uh, soft core, and that would be a bad thing in this case. So I wanted to depress the material that was going to form the fuller. If you imagine, well, I could have left this one. Uh, sort of a... If I would grind the fuller in, I would, I would expose the soft iron core and some ugliness here, perhaps. So I would rather forge the shape and pinch the iron in the process, giving me a little bit more to work with afterwards in, in grinding. Because regardless of how closely you, you forge to shape, you're going to face hours in front of the grinder and hours in front of, you know, the polishing table. Um, after forging in the fuller, oh, perhaps I should explain that a bit further. You can see that there's like um, a little short section of round bar, and on the opposite side, there's an exactly similar section of round bar. Um, and I, what I do is I, I have the vise, and I, I have the one round bar like like this, and then a piece of iron like a spring and then the other round bar. And then you have the blade in between these and you blow, put the hammer on, on, strike with the hammer there and you make depressions in the blade. And, and you try to keep this straight as you, as you work down the, uh, the blade from, fr and you start the, the, the full in the tang already and, and move it out to where it's supposed to end in the blade. I start out with a more narrow fullering tool to guide me uh, because that gives me a little bit of wiggle room when I, I work with the wider, the, the bigger diameter uh, that will sort of widen this further. The fuller will also make something like, it'll make the material thinner in the middle but it also squish us out material to the sides. So it makes the available material wider. You can make more of a sword with less material with the fuller. That's the reason why you have a fuller there. It's not to make the blade stiffer. That's another strange myth that is very, very uh, prominent. A, a fuller doesn't make the sword stiffer. It makes it more flexible. It's more giving. Because you're reducing material from the part of the sword that resists bending the most. But it's, it's like an H-beam in a construction. You, you only have the material where it makes the most use. So it's an economical feature, again. After the fuller is forged in, I forge the edge bevels. Uh, and this is done at a decreasingly lower temperature, uh, giving you more and more control over the shape and moving less less material as you go by. And you will never edge pack steel by doing this. Sometimes you will hear this, that the forging will actually compress the iron atoms, making them denser and smaller. And I'd like to see the smith who could actually do that. I wouldn't like to shake his hand, because it would leave me without an arm, I think. Because the strength it would take to compress steel, it's just unimaginable. The thing is that the, 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 the work done by the rolling mill in the steel production um, factory reduces the, the, the cross-section of the steel to such an amount that your little forging in the end will make no difference in comparison. So forging has very, very little to do with grain refinement. Um, it has mostly to do with uh, plastic forming. You can easily destroy good steel by forging it if you overheat or forge at too low a temperature. But if you're careful with temperature and cycle it at the right temperature, you will, at the same time as you're forging, perform a kind of normalizing, which will actually reduce grain size. But it's the temperature cycling that 
that does this grain refinement, not your little hammer. Um, so another thing that you'll keep doing all through work is checking for straightness, because this long ribbon of semi-rigid steel will, will want to play tricks on you. And if you, if you, if you depress one side, uh, it will grow, so you'll make a little bend, and then you'll have to straighten that by depressing the other side, and, and then you'll get depressed, because it'll go all, all, all over the place. So, so checking for straightness is something you, you, you keep doing through, throughout uh, bladesmithing. So it's very nice to have a, a, a blank wall with um, reflecting light that you can actually hold up the sword against and, and, and see its shadow because it's going to be surrounded with heat shimmer and, and all kind of strangeness. So you, you, it's, it's exciting to do this. It's surprising sometimes. After you've done this, you've done some rough grinding, rough um, filing to um, get a very even um, form. And sorry, I don't have images of this, but just like I said, with, with the forging, if, if you compress one side more than the other, you, you'll get a saber. The same thing is if you have one side of the blade just marginally thicker than the other, this one will react differently in treating than this side. So the, res the, the blade, uh, it'll want to bend this way. So the final sword will look like this instead of straight. So you have to be very careful that you that you, when you do the filing, well, forging, filing, grinding, everything like this, that your end result will be a very symmetrical form. Um, likewise, if, if the ridge on one side is further from the center of the edge than on the other side, this will bend the sword. So it's a lot about really smoothing down and evening everything else out in a, in a nice way to get this normalized form and normalized structure, everything should be peaceful and calm. And you've heard others saying this, that it's all about keeping sort of focus and calm. And if someone happens to be a temperamental person, that can be rather challenging at times, but perhaps it's the most important lesson and one of the most strongest pulls into this craft. It's, it's all about learning focus and, and, and striving for, for, a, for a goal, an image you have just in your head and just bring it out into shape, into steel. Oh, I should say something about heat treating, I guess. I'm skipping over things here. Heat treating is taking the steel up to a temperature where it will change its structure um, and cooling it rapidly will lock it into a form that is unnatural at room temperature. This is a, ten, a structure under tension, and this tension creates hardness. And you, after quenching it in oil or, or water, these modern steels take to quenching in, in oil quite readily. That's why you see the, the flashing up of flames there. It's hot oil, so it, it'll flash a little bit at the, at the surface. Uh, after doing this, you, you temper it. You, you heat it up gently to reduce some of the hardness and the brittleness that may be the result of this process. So you get a blade that is a, a, a happy mix, again, of the two impossible parallels of, of hard and tough. The harder something is, the more brittle it becomes. The less brittle it become is, the, the, the less hard it is. So you have to find some kind of happy balance. Fine grains makes a higher hardness possible with a retained toughness. After all this, you sort of, you give birth to the final shape of the sword. You, you give it, uh, you know, the sense of a real blade by grinding, grinding and polishing. And this is, this is a minute activity. Just remove tiny bits of material. But it, this, the sword is all about this. Uh, it's all about this margin where it, where it exists and where it ceases to exist. It's really, if you like, it's, it's really an, an, an image of, of uh, this impossible thing of, 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 of a sharp edge, how, how steel can, can meet in this nothingness of sharpness and, and, and still be a resilient sword blade. Uh, so this is this is the dream and sort of the obsession of, of well most swordsmiths I, 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 I know that is to to bring this form down to this perfected sharpness somehow. <laughs>
Uh, and this is done by grinding and hand polishing. I do the rough grinding uh, with um, a spray, a, a jet or, of water. This is to mimic the, the medieval water-cooled stones. Since I don't have a water wheel and a stone, I will have to make do with a, with a belt grinder, which is sufficient but also builds heat. So I, I put a little water hose and, and a fan of water to, to cool the blades, it, and it makes me all soaking wet at the same time. But it's it's worth it, uh, I think. And then you have a few happy hours with, with emery paper and, and wooden blocks, creating a lot of dust. And this process will sort of bring out bad memories in the blade. So if there were tendencies of twists or bends, they will resurface again. So you have to reheat it quite gently and put it in press and re-straighten it. Every sword bends, every sword curves, and you ha just have to deal with it. It's frustrating and it's part of the fun. And then you go to the making of the hilt, which is the guard and the pommel, uh, forging, grinding, filing, fitting, checking for proportion and size, filing some more, fit some more, and finally you seal everything down by putting the guard in place over the tang, and in this case I have a locking screw, the wheel swords don't have that. And then you put the, the pommel in place, and once that is um, where you want it, you, you heat up the, the end of the tang that sticks out from the pommel and, and strike it with a hammer so it mushrooms out forming a rivet head. And this rivet head, it was really sort of holds the, locks the, the pommel in place. Um, the method I use in sword making means that I, I put the grip on last. It's not a thing that is sort of threaded on with the rest, but the grip is made in two halves, hollowed out to fit the tang and then glued in place, bound down with cord and covered with leather that, as it's drying from the hide glue, is also bound with cord. And this cord leaves a depression in the leather, makes it look like it's cord rather than leather. And this is something that you see on original swords. It's a very resilient type of grip. It becomes almost like a glass fiber or composite material with the cord and the hide glue and the leather. And here you see the happy moment when the, the sort of old relative meets the, 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 the new guy on the block. And, and it was a great moment for me. This was now, I don't remember if it was 10 or 11 years ago. So. It's also with mixed feelings I see this today, but it was a great, great project and a, and a great opportunity to, to learn a lot about the sword. Um, I will quickly show you some recent work. Um, this is a ceremonial sword with pattern welded steel and um, sculpted and cast silver. Um, a long sword inspired by the finds from the Castillon hoard, uh, swords that belong to the mid 15th century. This is a big, rather hefty long sword, but with a very dedicated and acute balance. Uh, there you can see how you can work with that little last riveting of the tang and, and make it into a, a sort of a statement. Uh, this is a bit later in style, it's sort of early 16th or very late 15th century. A very, very broad sword. It's almost like eight centimeters at the base. This is another copy, or rather, this is an exact copy of one of the Castillon swords, a very typical kind of sword from that horde. Um, a sword in 13th century style, not a copy, but a sort of free interpretation of a style. And uh, another Castillon sword. Uh, this is a very precise copy of one of the finds there. Uh, you can see how you can work the leather, you can see the faint impressions of the cord, and you can work up the sheen of the leather with a, a piece of bone. Uh, and I find the leather work as a rather pleasant part of the making of a sword. It makes for a nice contrast with the steel. This is something I don't normally do. This is a sabre uh, with a blade of pattern welded steel. This is a type of sabre that's very ancient. It belongs to the Kassar culture, or the Alance, or any of these uh, um, horse people. Uh, and this could be actually Viking period in, in origin or, or timing, although in its present guise it's more of a timeless sword. It doesn't pretend to be a replica of an actual historical sword. It was fun to make. Um, 
So, we turn to the engineering of the sword. And this is, to me, one of the most interesting parts, because the sword is an object that is made to be in motion. Uh, it's, it's very, very much an object that expresses speed and precision, much more so than strength and resiliency. When you hear about the sword in, in, in modern descriptions, you always hear how powerful and heavy and, and imposing it is. And that's the least of its qualities, to my mind. To me, it's an expression of, of, of sharpness, of precision, of agility, of speed. It's more like uh, the, the wing of an airplane than, than a crowbar. It's very, very much about uh, mass distribution and an efficient use of material. There's, in a good blade, there is no dead meat. There's just enough material there to do its intended job. And if anything, the edges are on the thin side. They are probably much sharper than, than most people realize today. Uh, I think most people have kitchen knives in their drawers that are duller than sort of a, a, a typical medieval sword. Um, I could actually show this image as, as a direct uh, comment to that. The, the famed katana of the Japanese um, samurai, famed for his superior sharpness. Sharpness is a direct result of geometry. As my friend Roman Dande says, geometry says how sharp. The steel and the heat treatment says for how long. So you can, you can make a very soft material extremely sharp, but it may not even stay sharp during its first cut. So you need a certain degree of hardness for it to have a, a practical sort of lasting sharpness. But the sword is not a carving knife. You're not going to use it all day long. You're going to use it for a few decisive cuts, even in a battle. So it's not, it's not made to stay sharp forever. It's made to be very sharp for exactly when you need it. Uh, and again, when you say something about swords, you will always find these exceptions. You'll find swords that are surprisingly dull when compared to their cousins. So trying to describe the sword in a general like way like this is, is, is uh, an imp impossible mission. But I'll try to give you some kind of general idea at least. So the sharpness of a sword as a, as a rule is a result of a very sort of slim Gothic arc. And the overall geometry of the cross section uh, has to do with how you deal with uh, distribution and of mass and things like that. But the very last part of, of, of the geometry, this is the, the actual edge geometry, the, the curving of the lines here and the final angle that is what is the the actual sharpness of the blade so if you if you look at this series of images you can see the katana at the top followed by a sax which is the single edged sword or or war knife of the germanic warriors in the pre-viking and early viking period uh, an ingelry sword which is late viking period a double-edged rather hefty uh, sword Type 10A, this is a late 12th century, or, or um, well, it, this is the sword of the knight in, in full male armor, sort of the, the Ivanhoe type of sword, something he would have had. Uh, a Type 13A is a little bit later, this is a really big uh, war sword. Uh, and finally, a sword from the 15th century, Type 18A, uh, with a hollow ground cross section. It's a larger version of, of my little miniature hobbit sword here, uh, which, which has concave surfaces. This one happens to be completely blunt for safety reasons now, but, but uh, the last section of the edge is, is shaped into this apple seed edge. And if we do an enlargement of this, focusing on these last few millimeters, you can see how strikingly similar the actual edges are. And I should say, all these cross sections are taken from actual originals. So these are not just you know, symbolical or, or, or uh, somehow standardized images. These are examples of surviving originals. So you can see that if anything, the katana has the slightly blunter edge angle, but we shouldn't draw conclusions like that because there will be a larger variation between swords within each si uh, type than between types. So you can't really say that the katana is sharper than the Viking sword. That's an impossible to say, say, to th uh, thing to say. Uh, the sword is as sharp as it has to be. And 
across cultures, across millennia, that kind of sharpness remains surprisingly similar. Um, what varies is how, for how long they stay sharp. Um, but sharpness is, is not all. Of course, a sword needs to cut or thrust, but it has to land its blow exactly where and exactly when uh, the swordsman uh, intends to. You can say that, as I said, the sword is made to be uh, in, in motion. It's made for precision. It's made for speed. Uh, its uh, form is decided from its metallurgy and, and its craft traditions, but also of the scale of economy. If you think about the sword in the Germanic, um, the, the migration period, when you have those bejeweled hilts with, with garnets and, and, and yellow and, and the pattern welded blade, these are really objects of the highest status. They are made to, to make a point that this is an awesome ruler or, or a very, very um, highly regarded uh, henchman who has a, a weapon like this. Compare that to the, the, the sword of the Roman uh, legionary, the Gladius, which is an extremely humble weapon. Um, and it's, it's a reflection both of its role in society, but also on the scale of economy where it's made. Uh, type of warfare will, will definitely play a part. Is it cattle raiding? Is it going to be... Um, uh, a, a terror war against civilians? Is it, is it made for a duel against another gentleman? Um, so the, the, the type of conflict will, will absolutely have an, an impact on, on its design. So you can't say one type is better than the other. It's a direct result from the situation it was made for. Defensive equipment, is it made to meet armor or, or shields? It will never defeat a shield or armor but it has to survive the conflict with shields and armor uh, and still do its job. You won't cut through armor with a sword. Armor is to protect against the sword. If you don't have armor you or a shield, you're in a very, very bad position because, as a rule, they tend to be horrifically efficient. But another thing that, that also plays part in the design is the idea of conflict. What is the fight about? Is it... Uh, saving Christendom? Is it uh, enlarging the empire? Is it um, proving your own honor? The idea what the conflict is about will also have a great impact on the design of the sword, ever as much as function or craft or metallurgy. So it's a very, very complex and, and, and rich object like that. If I'm going to talk about the dynamics of the sword, how it, how it moves, how it wants to behave in, in a sword fight, you need to understand the concept of rotational inertia. Uh, and this is just to point out that the point of balance is not so important as you may think. If you have three bars of steel or any material, one looks like this, the second looks like this, and the third looks like, like this. Even if badly drawn, they are intended to have the balance point exactly in the middle. Now imagine trying to put these in motion by rotation. So you can imagine that the one with, with very pointy ends will be much, much more easy to put into rotation than it, both its neighbors. And the one that will be most difficult to put in rotation is the, is the dumbbell bar. That's a very crude picture, but still you can get an idea that the distribution of mass in a sword over its length will have a great impact on how it feels in your hand, much more so than where actually the point of balance is. So this is what you play with as a swordsmith, how you, how you let it grow thinner, how you change the cross-section, how you work with fullers. It's all about sort of pushing the material somewhere where you want it and where it makes uh, the, the, the most uh, use. Without a hilt, this sword will have a balance point, you know, somewhere like two-fifths from its tang end or three-fifths from its point. Um, if I would move, if I would use this in a sword fight, it still feels, well, it's pretty agile, but it still sort of doesn't really react to my intention so well. And this is something that can be described or, or observed with something that we call uh, rot points of uh, rotation. If I hold the hilt just at the front where the guard will sit and move the hilt sideways, you will find that there is a point 
where it will tend to hover still in air. This is something of great importance if you want to understand the dynamic of the sword, how it wants to move in motion, or <laughs> how it reacts to motion, or changes in motion. Um, there is a forward pivot point, uh, well, there's a pivot point in every place along the tang that will have a different pivot point in the blade. But if we look for pivot points, we should look for the forward one, which is closer to the guard, and the aft one will, sh will be close to the pommel. So we can say that the forward pivot point in this blade, it's... Well, it's right about there. I'll make a mark there with, with a permanent pen not for the whiteboard. If I'm going to use this for the whiteboard, please scream. So we set an, a, a, a line and an A there. And then we tested the aft pivot point. And we can see that's a, a little bit further up the blade, somewhere there. Pretty, pretty close together. That's the aft pivot point. Another thing that matters is how the sword reacts on impacts, because when you, when you cut and strike with a sword, it will be subject to, to vibrations. And, and this has an, uh, uh, an importance for how the sword will bite in a cut. Um, so we can look for something that we call the nodes of no vibration. Um, and in the unmounted blade, we'll find there's such a point uh, at the base of the blade. I don't know if you can see this in the, the camera, but right here, there's a place where the, where the blade actually don't vibrate. And likewise, there's a point in the blade where it doesn't vibrate. I can actually hold these place points and, and not dampen the sword. So, these have, have importance for, for the engineering of the sword, and they will change as you change the balance. I should mark them out for, for your reference. You have the, the upper node here. Let's mark it with this squiggly line, and you have the lower node was there. So forward, off, forward pivot point, off pivot point, the, the blade node and the, the upper node, which will be later the hilt node. So, I should mark out the point of balance as well. It was some, somewhere there. So now let's, let's put a, 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 a pommel on this sword. And just to, to vary things, I will make a pommel of plasticine here. And we can note that already this has shifted the point of balance by uh, some four centimeters. Not, it's not a lot of weight, actually. And if I... Uh, check the pivot points, we can note that the, f the forward pivot point was right about there before, but now it's moved to where the forward node was. Uh, let's see what happened with the upper node. Is it, it's actually not there anymore. It's, it's much closer to inside the hilt. You see, it's actually moved into the tang. And the blade node is now no, lo no longer here that it used to be. It's also actually moved upwards towards the hilt. So the, the pivot points, they have moved forward, but the vibration nodes have been attracted back towards the hilt. So I can add some more material and see what happens. We, we move the point of balance further, further back, to the hilt, now by a little bit more than five centimeters. The, the forward pivot point is, is further down the blade. And let's see where we have the nodes. Well, that's a fair bit back into the hilt. And it's somewhere there. Now, we, we want to, to think about what, what kind of balance do we want for this sword? Well, it depends on what, what kind of sword fight it's going to be used for. This is like a long sword for hobbits. So it, it has it's 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 some kind of three quarter size long sword. I I wanted to show you this because I think the balance of the long sword is very revealing. It's not going to have the same goal in balance as you have in a on a on a single handed sword. But let's focus now on the long sword. Uh, 
The long sword is used without a shield. The long sword is used both for attack and uh, um, defense. So you want a balance that will, and it's also used a lot in thrusting. So the balance of the sword should aid you, should, should be a, a, a natural motion for you in this kind of sword fight. And in many cases, these swords are balanced so that the forward pivot point is very close to the actual point of the sword because uh, this will give you a very specific effect. I will just shortly show you this. I put a, a, a guard on and I put a, a pre-made pommel on that I also have a locking screw for. So now you can see that the node has actually moved to the, to the middle of the grip where I will have the heel of my hand, which can have some beneficial effects. The blade node has moved considerably back. So it's where the, the first forward pivot point was. So that has moved back by some three and a half centimeters, while the upper node has moved by easily three times as much. The, the forward pivot point is now right at the point of the sword. You see, it, it seems to hover still in the air as I'm moving the hilt. And when I, I check for the aft pivot point, it's right about here, which is strangely enough very close to the original aft pivot point. And this, this, this distribution of mass will have the effect that when you, when you move the sword in wards, when you, when, you, when you protect yourself with the hilt, the point will naturally stay centered on your opponent. And this is for a for a nicely balanced sword. This will this will make your 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 the swordsman think that wow, wow this sword this is an extension of my arm. But I say it's even more than that. It's extension of the swordsman's mind, because your mind is exactly where this point is. This sword moves naturally in guards and wards and stays right on target and this is a very disturbing thing to be aimed at with because this sword is unwaveringly right at you this is a very very dedicated fencing weapon right now it's it's become a sword from just being an unmounted blade so for this to happen, the blade must by itself have a good balance. It needs to have a very specific distribution of mass, a uh, very specific change of thickness and width and um, cross-section for the pommel to be able to do its job. Um, you, can't, you can never make a, a clunky blade into an agile sword. It will just be very heavy to counterbalance a heavy blade. The effect is often something like this. If I put an overly heavy pommel on a blade, what you will get is a pivot point that is far outside the blade itself. This is somewhere at the floor or beyond. And trying to use this in swordsmanship is very awkward. It's like trying to fence with, with a four meter long oar because this, the feeling of the sword is, it is as long as its forward pivot point. Uh, and the elegant thing with the, with the long sword is that when you put the second hand into play, it effectively shortens the blade. So it will, it will turn on a dime. That is one of the reasons why you have these long swords. They will invite a very dynamic and very quick style of swordsmanship. If the forward hand leads or the aft hand leads, your sword will change character in very intuitively. So it's a very strong response to you. Now, my time is um, cutting short here, so I want to thank you very much for your attention. Um, tomorrow, I will return a little bit to these things because the proportion of the sword will have a great importance for its function, as I hinted at here. Um, but it, the proportions carry much, much more than that. They, they have a very specific signature for the medieval sword. A sword that lacks very much of later and earlier eras of embellishment. It's very stark, it's very reduced in its form. Simple, you might think, but once you try to make a few, you understand just how difficult it is to, f to, to get it just right. It's like chamber music. 
there's there's nothing to hide behind. If you're slightly off, you'll, it's like striking a chord that is off. So it has to do with mass distribution, engineering, and also understanding the, the, the society and the place in time it was used. And also, I think we are well off to look at the aesthetic qualities of the sword. What is it that makes the sword so captivating, just its image? And I think uh, there are interesting things we can note, but this is for tomorrow. So thank you for your attention today. Peter, I wonder if you take a couple of questions. Yes, absolutely. We, we, we have we can, time. We can certainly go along. You're the last presenter okay. today. We okay. Did this, we did Shoot. This, we did this on purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I recently learned uh, through watching a movie that uh, we all know here, the Reclaiming the Blade, that the uh, sword was often grabbed by the user mid-blade itself, half-sword technique. Yes. And I'm wondering if the, uh, the pivot points uh, were in any way uh, built with that in mind. I don't think so. Um, um, because once you once you grab the blade, the sword becomes very very different. It's it's sure. more akin to uh, a rifle with a bayonet or something like that, or a short spear. So everything I said about sword dynamics is out the window. This becomes a very different thing. But you won't half sword just any sword. You would you would never ever think about half swording this sword. Not if you because once you grasp fingers. this, it'll be it'll be <laughs> sausage salad on the on the ground because <laughs> it's like. Uh, it's not made for grasping. It's made for not grasping. But but a sword, a long, even this one is slightly on the wide side. So when you when you look at these manuals where where they describe half swording, it's always a very specific kind of sword that we today describe as a type 15A, meaning it's really a sharp spike of steel. They tend to be thick. They tend to be very robust, extremely thick, uh, uh, stiff, and there are as a rule in in this. The, the outer third, they're not very wide, about two fingers. Mm. And you could just try this. Try to grasp of four fingers or two fingers. And you see that the two fingers will, will comfortably fit into your hand. You can imagine that this sword can actually be pretty sharp, but just by body, by your sort of, um, what's the word? Um, um, yeah, body mechanics or um, anatomy. I mean, the, the, the palm has a certain width, and you, you can grasp things that are less wide than your palm and do so quite safely, even if sharp. Um, half swording was made predominantly for fighting uh, others in armor, because you will, you, will, you will beat yourself senseless trying to you know, cut through steel armor. It doesn't happen. It's only in the movies it does. You won't even cut mail with any great success. But the point, however, you can drive that through gaps in the armor. You could try to find the, the holes, the slits in the viscer, or finding a way under the helmet or under other parts of the armor, finding other soft spots in the body. So it's a very, it's a very direct and, and, and brutal way to use the sword, specifically to defeat people in armor. But it was also used in civilian fencing. You see um, these judicial duels between burghers. It could be the potter and the and the silversmith who, who had an affair that didn't go well, so they, uh, or perhaps one had an affair with the other's wife. I don't know. <laughs> they, they had a point of quarrel, and they needed to settle that, and it was done with swords uh, and long swords. So this is another myth that goes out the window, that the sword was the exclusive property of the knight. That is not so, because quite early on, the sword was uh, of focus for other uh, people. We, the earliest fencing manual that exists, except for some paintings in ancient Egypt that shows stick fighting and wrestling, is a, is a French or German uh, manual from around year 1300? No, 12? Oh, I'm going to be... Help me out. The 133, is it 1200 or is it 1300? I think it's 1300. Oh my. Around year 1300, is, is a fencing manual showing the fighting with sword and buckler. They tend to be a little bit smaller than this one, but this could also be used in sword and buckler fighting. And the, the, the people who are fighting is, is called the priest or the scholar, the student, and Valpurgis. So one of the fighters is actually a woman. And they, they fight this thing out with, with sword and buckler. And very happily so, they all have very content smiles on their faces as they... <laughs> 
prepare to impale the other's head or whatever they're doing. It's a very efficient fighting method, but it's also almost like a sport, a spectator sport. And, and this expression of swashbuckler comes from this thing. You had these gangs in, in London who went around seeking trouble with these bucklers and the swords. And they could be apprentices or journeymen or students seeking quarrel with the other gang and they met at a certain field outside London and, and cut the, each other's noses off or some other honorable thing. This thing with, you know, the, the German students with their, their, their scars in the face has a very long tradition. It shows that you had the guts to meet someone with a ill intent and a sharp steel in his hand. And it's, it's all about this macho myth. But they didn't want really to kill each other, just mark each other. <laughs> Cuts below the belt was out of the picture, and, and you know they didn't really thrust; they made flesh wounds. Um, once they started to use rapiers, that's when they started to die from inflammations and nasty stuff. A few days later, so that's th that. But that's another story. Yes. A an another question about vibrational nodes. Yes. It, it, it seemed somewhat obvious to me, and uh, it may not be the case, but it seems obvious that the, one of the reasons you'd want the vibrational node at the point of the grip was to reduce shock to the hands of the wielder once, you, once the blade was struck. Is that yes, right? well, um, in part, yes, but it's more important for reducing shock is the thing with the pivot points, because the, uh, if the sword pivots around a point, it, will, it won't transmit shock. So if I have pivot points in the, in the grip that corresponding to parts in the blades that are going to be active in the cutting, if, if this part of the blade corresponds to this part of, of the grip, it will be greatly shock reducing. It, the, the, the pivot points will also be a point of stiffness. Um, if I so if I, if I strike the blade outside the node, it will be pretty wobbly. I'm not sure if that comes through in the, in the picture. But if I, if I strike the node, it's going to be stiff as a plank. So the, the node is a point of stiffness. And that makes this place in the blade, of course, especially suited for cuts against hard targets, where there otherwise could be severe vibrations. But even more so, if you have a if you have a node at the heel of your hand where you might grasp the sword most for forcefully, you know striking outside the, the this node and you'll have a wobbly sword. But in the node, it becomes stiff as a plank. Ah. So if you if you hold the node uh, uh, pivot point, you will you will grasp grasp this the, that 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 um, no, sorry. If you, if you grasp the, the, the node, you will grasp that, that point of stiffness. And the, the, um, the impact then you, you get in the edge will not be transmitted into your arm because if you strike somewhere here, your hilt will naturally pivot in your hand right at some of these points you have inside your hand. And this also reduces the possibility of the sword breaking, correct? Because of yep. the, vi the vibration, the, the actual flexing of the blade is when it, and it breaks. Maybe it will. I, I would talk to someone who is more advanced in, in engineering than I am. Because, but of course, vibrations will make things break. Right. But I think uh, a greater thing is if you get a notch in the blade. Uh, that could induce breaking. So when you found, find swords, uh, old swords that are broken, they, they tend to, be, to break at the base somewhere because that's where you receive heavy... Uh, incoming blows and in a desperate situation you just ward them off with with the sword or typically perhaps more often they, they break somewhere here where you typically cut and may notch the blade uh, against armor or a shield or something you know or getting stuck in a bone and something you know so that's if you get a notch there that can be a breaking point um, I'm not sure how much the, the nodes or, or pivots will play a role there, but the pivots have definitely a, um, a role in how the sword will move, but also in shock reducing. Nodes, that is vibration nodes, will play a role in, in this thing of reducing shock, but not to the same degree as the pivot points will. And it's important to keep them quite apart, because as you remember, when I'm adding the pommel to the blade, the node, the place that stands still in, vi in vibrations, will move back 
towards the hilt. But the pivot points will move forward. So they go apart. But somewhere you will find a balance, and I'm going to reveal a real secret to you. Somewhere you will find a balance where the node that is pulled back towards the pommel will coincide with the placing of a pivot point that is moving forward. So you have a blade that in this exact spot where you have a, a vibration node, you will also have a pivot point that corresponds to the blade node. And then things start to happen with the sword, because it, it becomes extremely purposeful. You can see this in originals. And I believe that, I'm not sure that the, the medieval swordsmiths were at all concerned with pivot points and nodes. I should say this. This is a modern concept to understand a sword. But they had concepts of what the sword should be that gave exactly these signatures. Um, no, 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 not that one. Not that one. Thank you. <laughs> so you can have um, a Viking sword. This is going to be a beautiful Viking sword here, of a little bit Anglo-Saxon influence there. Uh, and you can have a, a knightly sword. A little bit slimmer and, and longer in the blade. And you can have a medieval long sword. That doesn't necessarily need to have a longer blade than the single handed sword, by the way. And then you can have a, a rapier. Can you s make this out? Yes, they can. These are masterful drawings. <laughs> And we, you would expect to find intuitively that the pivot point on the rapier, that needs to be at the point, right? But that's not so. The typical placing of the pivot point for, for the rapier, the forward one is there and the aft one is there. On the, on the sort of, if there is anything like a typical Viking sword, you will find this placing of the forward and aft pivot points. For the medieval single hand sword, it must be something like that. And for the long sword, you may find something like that. A, I always mark the forward one with A and the aft one with B. It's just for habit. I have these glyphs I use. So you have like the, the, the balance point might be here. Or there. Or there or something like that. And then you have the nodes, and that could be uh, something like, like this for the Viking, something like that for the knightly sword. And interestingly enough, you'll find the node just in front of the god on many rapiers, and the node right in between there. And for the rapier, it, this becomes a natural uh, and, and attractive kind of balance because in rapier fighting you are, are as a rule contacting your opponent's blade. Very quickly in a, in a rapier sword fight you will, you will get into contact with your opponent's blade. And just imagine what they are trying to do. They are trying to circle around each other's blade. So you want them to, to pivot here around these blades. You don't want the point to stand still because you would have to really work your way around things to, to get it to go where you want to. And, uh, and this is really very eminently so, for, for the rapier. The long sword, on the other hand, is often used in front of you in wards and attacks, so you, you really want that forward pivot point. While the two single-handed swords, think about it, if you had the pivot point out at the very end, you'd have to move all that material around as you, as you charge for another cut, while instead you have a pivot point that is much more centrally placed, which makes this sword much quicker to move around. So, it's, it, it comes as a, a, a natural result of how the sword is intended to, to, to move in the sword fight. Again, motion is, is the mission of the sword. Speed and motion. Yes. Anything else? <laughs>
You're just laughing. <laughs> you want to go to... Thank you so much. For well, this. thank you. It was a pleasure. I, you know, I want to draw to everyone's attention. Everyone here in the room knows this, but if, if you watch how casually Peter just gave you an absolute treasure. I mean, this knowledge that he is shown in these little dashes here, how many hundreds of hours of research, how few people understand this, um, all of this data that he gave you that he worked very, very hard to get, years of study and toil, just, hey, here, here it is. I mean, the incredible generosity that these scholars and artists and craftsmen are giving here is truly remarkable. So this has been the first day of Arctic Fire. Um, it has been incredibly successful so far. I hope you've enjoyed it. We've got just as good a stuff tomorrow. And tomorrow, Peter's lecture is like the Da Vinci Code meets swords. It's the coolest thing ever. Your head will explode. So Stay have a tuned. good night. Stay tuned. Uh, we got another one from Jake tomorrow and lots of other cool. And tomorrow there will be much more fire involved. Uh, we will have, you know, we'll have much more foraging. Stay tuned. We're probably going to go eat some pizza and beer, and then we're going to come back and screw around in the forge. The cameras will be rolling. We probably won't do a lot of directly addressing the camera, but if, you, if you'd if you like to see us uh, screwing around kind of in that uh, jam session, as we talked about, of Smith's kind of screwing around in the forge, seeing what we want to build, that's going to be going on later tonight. So tune in. Thanks for tuning in today uh, so far, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.